Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and thank you so much for tuning in today. We should start out by admitting that the Africa Twin is neither the lightest, nor the fastest, nor the highest performing adventure bike. However, despite that, the Africa Twin has been a choice for riders all around the world for decades now who want a solid, good performing, ultra reliable, ultra high quality adventure bike. To fully understand and appreciate the Honda Africa Twin, you have to go beyond the surface of the pages of the magazine. You have to dig deeper to really understand what is the appeal to this bike and what are the things that really make it stand out. A few months ago, I purchased this Africa Twin here. This is the 2022 Africa Twin Adventure Sports with the manual transmission. And this bike, I chose it to replace my long-term test bike, uh, which I also owned, paid my own money for, which was a BMW R1250 GS Adventure. So I'm buying these bikes, the GS and now this Africa Twin, for content on my channel, but also because they really fit the needs of my personal riding style. So here's what you can expect in today's video. This is not gonna follow the same structure as most of the motorcycle reviews I do because this is a long-term test bike. So this is really gonna be sort of a long-term update number one, if you wanna call it that. And here's how I'm gonna break this down. I'm gonna tell you what I like so far about the bike and what I don't like so far about the bike. And I'm gonna be brutally honest, especially because I own this bike. And I'm also gonna take you for a ride on the highway and of course also off-road to show you what it's like to really ride this bike in the environment it was designed for. All right, so I'm not gonna cover every single uh, you know, specification of this bike. I'm gonna put a lot of the specs down below in the video description and you can also look that up online if you care about those things. But just for the basics, this is the Adventure Sport model, which has the larger fuel tank, more features. So this bike comes in at around $17,300 US. And in terms of weight, it's coming in around 525 pounds, fully fueled up with six and a half gallons or about 25 liters of fuel. It uses an 1100cc parallel twin engine, putting out around 100 horsepower, and I'll put the torque down below, but I think it's somewhere around 77 pound-feet. So I've talked about this in some of my other videos, but the Africa Twin kind of falls in between something like a big GS or a big Multistrada or a big KTM 1290, somewhere between that and you know the Tenere 700s and the KTM 890s. So it pulls a bit from both the full size sort of mega adventure bikes and the mid-size adventure bikes. And depending on your perspective, that could either be a strength or it could be a weakness. From my point of view, it's actually a bit of a strength. So why don't we jump into what are the pros to this bike? What are the things that have really stood out to me as an owner of the bike that I really, really like so far? So number one is definitely gonna be the technology. And what I wanna hone in on is the Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. So to understand why this is such a killer feature, let's just jump to that video. All right, I have an Android phone, so we're gonna be covering Android Auto uh, for this video. So here's the basics of how this works. Now, a couple things you need. You have to have a Bluetooth headset on your helmet. It doesn't matter which unit you have, but you have to have a headset in order for this to work. Second thing is you're gonna to need to plug your phone in to the USB port on the bike. So it's not a wireless system. Now, normally I have my phone mounted up here, but I'm changing around some mounts right now. So I just stuck it in the uh, Pico tank back here for a second. You do have to have it wired in. Now it's a bummer that it's not wireless because that'd be really cool. Uh, and I know vehicles have that because my truck has wireless Android Auto. But in any case, this allows the phone to be charging so your phone's always fully charged up when you're riding. So that's uh, that's a nice benefit to that. So you've got those things in place. Then if you pair your phone and your headset to uh, the Africa Twin through the menu, you're gonna have Android Auto. So here's how this works. So a lot of people, including myself, have complained about the switch gear on the left-hand side of the Africa Twin being too complicated. But once you start using Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, it makes sense why all these buttons exist. So let me exit the system here first. So this is the main dashboard of the bike, right? Now I've got everything enabled for Android Auto. So now let me back up. The reason that this bike has two uh, screens is because if you're using the upper screen for Android Auto, you still have your speed, uh, your trip computer and um, gear indicator and all your lights and stuff down here in addition to that. 
So in order to switch between the, the main display and the Android Auto display, you simply flick this button here back and then it goes back to your Android Auto or Apple CarPlay interface. So if you've used this in your car or in other devices, it really works in the same way. Now, the Africa Twin is also a touchscreen, so you can touch to control this if the bike is stopped, if the bike's moving, you have to use the switch gear. Once you get used to how this works, it actually is, I won't say it's totally intuitive, it's not intuitive at first, but it works very slick, very good, once you get a hang of what all the buttons do. Like for instance, the enter button really should be here and the back button should be here. They've kind of got that flipped around and, you know, they've got forward at the bottom and reverse at the top for music. I don't know, some things seem weird to me, but everything's here and it works really well. So let me show you what we're dealing with here. So first of all, you can, you can control, you can scroll through your Android Auto interface using the buttons here. So you've got, you've got a left right toggle and you've got an up and down toggle here as well. So depending on what you're doing, either of those will work. So you can use your apps. The great thing about that is you're not dependent on Honda to have navigation or to have a phone interface. It's all just through your phone and it works way better than the archaic and clunky um, uh, systems that you have on like the BMWs and on some of these other bikes and all the other bikes. This is the only bike that has Android Auto. So anyway, like if I go to Google Maps, I can now have full functionality of Google Maps. So everything is connected to the Google Maps I use, which I also use on my car when I have the phone plugged into my, to my car. So I can uh, do, I can use the buttons here, or since I'm stopped, I can use the touch screen. And it's Google, like it works extremely well. You don't have to deal with some crappy interface. So this is great. I can have my maps up and as I'm riding, I can use the left switch here to control. I can go in here and find a different route. Okay, I wanna to go to Costco, but I wanna I want to choose this other route. I can actually do this while I'm riding with the buttons here. Uh, so then I can go back. Now, if I want to go back to the main screen, again, I can do this all while I'm writing. I can go in here to control my music. So let's go into Pandora. Let's play music, right? So I can control that here. So you get the idea. I don't want to be too long-winded. But the great thing about this is, you know, everything's here. I mean, you, your phone calls, you can do different whatever apps you want. You're not beholden to the manufacturer to set up certain applications for you, which, which in my opinion, in my experience, never work well. So I really, really, this is a huge killer feature of this bike. And of course they also have it on the Goldwing and maybe other Honda models, but I absolutely love this. And of course then to get out, you just flick a switch and you're back to the dashboard. So this is the best way to interface your phone and your technology uh, to the motorcycle and to do navigation. It pretty much eliminates the need for a standalone GPS. I do have the Zumo XT here and that's for more like off-road navigation stuff, but I love this system, works awesome, I highly recommend it. The second thing I really love about this bike is the overall sense and feeling of quality, the fit and finish, the paintwork, the graphics, how everything is put together, the quality of all the components it just f seems at a very, very high level, even beyond the price point that this bike comes in at. I think that's something that Honda's really good at and something that in particular I've noticed with the Africa Twin. So that's definitely a huge plus for this bike. The third thing I love about this bike, so I have some rides planned coming up in uh, Baja and down in Mexico. And when you're traveling sometimes in other places or other countries, other parts of the world, you may not have access to high octane fuel. The Africa Twin, it's a low stress motor. It's a 10 to one compression ratio, meaning that the motor is not under a lot of strain and it's, it only requires 87 or low octane fuel. It doesn't require the premium fuel to run properly. That's most of the higher end, higher performance adventure bikes do. So if you're traveling in areas where access to high octane fuel is an issue, that's a huge, great feature. The number four thing I love about the Africa Twin is the Showa electronic suspension and in particular while I do find the spring rates to be a little bit too soft what I like about it the adjustability is really great so you can go into the computer you can fine-tune the damping and the preload for all your different riding modes and really get the suspension dialed in and do fine-tuning and that's a feature unfortunately you don't find on most bikes I'm thinking of the GS that I sold to get this bike on that bike you had like enduro mode road mode and you had like one you could firm up the damping by one step and that was it you didn't get to fine-tune the suspension 
So I think they did a really good job here. I also noticed the new Triumph Tiger 1200s that I've reviewed. They use the same Showa suspension as this and they have that same fine tuning adjustment. So that's a great thing. The fifth thing I love about this Adventure Sports version of the Africa Twin. So the standard Africa Twin, well, let me back up. Both Africa Twins have 21 inch front wheel and 18 inch rear wheel. So those wheel sizes are really good for off-road tire selection for knobby tires. And a 21 inch front wheel performs better off-road and my video is gonna show that here in a minute. Now on the Adventure Sports, you get tubeless rims, which is really great for me for a long distance traveling bike. I wanna be able to put a plug in the tire, not have to dismount it and put in a tube. Although you still need to carry a spare tube that's a subject for another day, but you still need to carry a spare tube in, in case you were to get a big uh, gash in the tire. So that's something I really like, having the tubeless rims on this model. Unfortunately, the base model Africa Twin still has tubes. The sixth thing I love about the Africa Twin, and this is a bit of a love-hate, so the engine, it's very smooth, linear, approachable, friendly power delivery. It also sounds really good and gives you a good sense of refinement. It just has enough thump and enough character uh, to, to give the bike some personality and give it good, strong acceleration pull. But on the other hand, it's not super fast, and so it's kind of a double-edged sword there. But overall, I really like the engine in this, and it's head and shoulders above the old Africa Twin 1000. So I've owned two of the different Africa Twin 1000s, the 2016 to 2019 models, and this engine is so much better than that bike. So don't compare it to that. The number seven thing I really love about it is the size of the fuel tank. So the Adventure Sports gives you a six and a half gallon or about a 25 liter fuel tank. I've talked about this before in other videos. I found the eight gallon or 30 liter fuel tank on the GS Adventure to be just overkill, too big, made the bike too top heavy. But I find the five gallon tank on the standard Africa Twin, uh, the non-adventure sports one, or bikes like the standard GS, that five gallon tank around 20 liters, just a little bit too small. The six and a half gallon tank, 25 liters, gives me uh, about a 250 to 300 mile range, depending on how fast I'm going, how hard I'm accelerating. And that's a perfect amount for me. I can do any ride I wanna do in the USA and never have to carry spare fuel, but it's not overkill. So good job on the gas tank size Honda. So number eight is going to be the fact that the engine is a dry sump design. Now, that doesn't really matter except for the fact that it gives the engine more ground clearance. So they're able to keep the engine high up off the ground, which means that this bike has class leading ground clearance. So I don't have to worry as much about scraping rocks or logs or things that I might encounter on the trail. So I like that dry sump design that increases the ground clearance. Number nine, this bike has a detachable subframe. A lot of adventure bikes don't have that. Some do, some don't, it just depends. But the nice thing about the detachable subframe is if you were to damage the rear frame of the bike in any way, you would be able to replace that instead of totaling the whole frame and perhaps totaling the whole bike in terms of insurance. So I really like having that. Number 10 is gonna be the dealer network. So it's a Honda, there's Honda dealers almost everywhere. You can get parts, you can get service, you can get stuff through the mail if you're traveling internationally. I really like having a Honda uh, this would also apply if you had a Yamaha, Suzuki, one of the big Japanese brands. They have good dealer networks and you can get parts for it. And I think that's a great thing. Number 11 on this list, and my last thing I wanna point out as something I really love is the TFT on this bike. It's bright, it's crisp, it has a lot of contrast. Most importantly though, I think is that it's a touchscreen. It's the only adventure bike that I can think of that has a touchscreen display. So when you're stopped, you can interact with the technology and with of course the Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, which I've showed by pressing buttons on the screen. You can fine tune suspension, all the settings with that and it's much faster than going through the using handlebar controls on any other adventure bike or on this bike. So I really like the design of the technology, the dual screen setup and the touch screen. I think it's great. All right, let's do some off-roading. So uh, on dirt roads like this, I have user two mode set up with the parameters I want for power engine braking. Um, the suspension settings I have fine-tuned in the menu ABS set to off-road mode, which is less intrusive, but it, the ABS is still on on the back wheel. Now, what I also have set up on the bike is the traction control has like uh, nine different levels or seven different levels or whatever it is, which is great. 
and I love the system. Now I have the star button or the favorites button programmed so I can dial in how much traction control I want as I'm riding. So for roads like this, I like about three bars, which lets me have a little bit of fun. So let's just go ride. So the electronic suspension on this bike, on this Adventure Sports version, is semi-active. It means that it adjusts the damping as you're riding. The bike does a pretty admirable job for a 530-pound bike in terms of controlling the chassis in this kind of uh, bumpy off-road high-speed terrain. Where it does fall apart, like most bikes, is that if you can't hit something really fast or really hard, it's not a rally bike, it will bottom out. Um, and there's a limit to the suspension. The suspension is set up to give you a pretty plush, soft ride. And it does a good job of that. And it keeps you in pretty good control. And for a open class or full-size adventure bike, this thing does very well off-road. Yeah, boy. So I think I said this in one of my other videos, but the Africa Twin, despite how big and heavy it is, it still has that feeling of like being a more of a giant dirt bike. Uh, whereas when you ride like a GS, and I talked about this in my comparison video, but I've ridden my GS 1250 Adventure on this on this trail a lot. And it's capable, it's fine, but it you feel that weight and, and it just doesn't feel quite as natural. And you can't ride the terrain at the same speed so this this bigger front wheel and this longer travel suspension with the conventional fork it doesn't it doesn't bang it doesn't bang through the terrain like the towel lever does on a beamer and uh, the whole bike just feels more balanced um, In terms of slow speed control on the Africa Twin, I find it to be very good. I just finished testing the Tiger 1200 Rally Pro, and one of the issues I had with that bike was in situations like this, let's say I want to lug the engine in second gear, which I shouldn't do, but even if I go into first gear, I can let off the throttle. And this bike doesn't have a tendency to stall, and it has good, a very nice smooth throttle transition, kind of like the GS does, so it's easy to ride if you want to ride at lower speeds and technical terrain. Um, I mean, you can still make it stall if you really try, but the clutch is very predictable. Good, good uh, clutch um, let out. It's, it's, you know, clutch is easy to modulate. Then when you get into the chunkier, rocky terrain like this, it's actually a lot of embedded rocks here. The Africa Twin is really good at smoothing this out. But there's a threshold that you can easily cross, you know. You have to keep your speed within check or else you're going to start bottoming the bike out because it's sprung a little bit too soft, just like all bikes are. The advantage of the soft springs is pretty plush ride. The disadvantage is you'll bottom the bike out if you start riding really fast. But, you know, how fast do you want to be riding on a 530-pound adventure bike in an off-road trail? So this trail gets really pretty rough and bumpy. And I think one of the last times I was on here, I was on the GS and this bike is so much more fun to ride on this than the GS is. And the traction control is very good. It's not, it's not so intrusive, it cuts in really gently, but uh, you know, you have, you can fine tune it. That's one thing that's great. On the GS, you only have like two or three settings for traction control. This bike, you have these, uh, whatever it is, eight levels or something um, on this pie chart here. So you can really fine tune it. And I appreciate that a lot. And the engine has a very linear, smooth delivery of torque. I really love the engine. It's not exciting on the street as we showed, but ah, going a little bit too fast here. But for off-road, the engine is superb. It's, it's very tractable, very linear, gentle power delivery. And you can fine tune the throttle response here, you've got four different uh, 
they call it power settings but really what it is is throttle settings it doesn't actually reduce the engine horsepower a lot of people are confused about that that's not what it does it just changes how the, th the throttle's relationship to the uh, throttle body or to the fuel injection. <laughs> Yeehaw! All right, so now let's cover what are the things that I've found that I really don't like about the Africa Twin. No motorcycle is perfect and I've definitely through and, and done with the honeymoon phase of this bike where everything's great. So done enough rides with it, I've spent enough time with it, and the purchase has worn off where I can tell you honestly the things I don't like. Number one thing that stands out for me is this motorcycle, especially in the adventure sports version with the larger gas tank, it's somewhat top heavy. So you feel this when you're lifting it off the side stand. It's exacerbated by the fact that the side stand on this bike is really too short by design. I don't know why Honda did this, but the bike leans very far over when it's on the side stand. It's on the center stand now, uh, but it, it makes it hard to pick up off the side stand. It makes it feel initially very heavy. Uh, and when you're, when you're parking the bike, when you're getting on and off, especially if you have a full load of luggage, like I often do with this bike, you notice the top heavy feeling. Now, other bikes were top heavy. I felt that my GS Adventure with the eight gallon tank was also top heavy. So I'm not saying that this is more top heavy than other bikes. It's more top heavy than like my KTM 890 for sure. It feels way heavier than that, but it, it probably sits somewhere in the middle overall, but the top heaviness is something that, you know, you feel the weight of the bike. It doesn't feel particularly light. Number two on my list, I kind of just mentioned this and gave it away, but the side stand is too short. I even put a little foot on the side stand for like parking and soft soil, which I do on all my bikes. But even with that, the side stand is just too short. And the bike, I mean, I test all sorts of bikes, right? Because I do this for a living. The bike leans over so far that it's hard to pick up off the side stand. And sometimes you feel like it's even gonna fall over, it leans so far. So I don't know why they did it that way. And uh, if anybody knows a good welder <laughs> that's nearby, maybe I could like extend it or something. But yeah, it's just something, a pet peeve that kind of bugs me. The third thing that I don't like is it takes a long time for the electronics, for the TFT screen to boot up. So what I've, I've learned to adapt and kind of work around this. So when I'm getting ready to ride, maybe like, you know, um, I'll go and flip the bike on, flip the key on, let stuff boot up while I'm putting on my helmet and my gloves. By the time I've got helmet and gloves on, it's pretty much booted up. So it's not a big deal, you get used to it. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you first own the bike, it's like, come on, why isn't the screen coming on and you're trying to ride away? So it can be kind of annoying. The fourth thing that I don't love about the bike, the wind protection and the wind buffeting is not great. So. Uh, the wind protection is okay in terms of how much coverage it has. The wind buffeting, especially as it was stock, is fairly bad. Now they put on a shorter windshield for the 2022 bikes, which is good because now I can see over the windshield. The earlier bikes were way too tall in the Adventure Sports version. Um, so I had a lot of wind buffeting. Uh, the other thing I don't like is that the screen adjustment, and this should be a whole separate item, on my list here, but the screen adjustment takes two hands. So you can't really do it while you're riding unless you set the cruise control and then use two hands to move the screen up and down because it has a latch on each side. Horrible design. It should be a one-handed operation like many other bikes are, like the Triumph is and like the BMW is, and I think the Ducati as well, maybe even the KTM. Big miss there by doing that. But back to the wind buffeting. So I put on some side deflectors from Puege. I put on the upper deflector, big visor from Puege. Um, I also put on a fork shield, which you can buy like on eBay from a company, it's uh, S Geotech or something. Anyway, separate video on mods later. But that saw, that made the wind control, the wind buffeting pretty good. I would say above average, not as good as a GSA that I was used to. Um, probably not even as good as a standard 1250 GS, but it's acceptable. It's not terrible with the mods that I've done. The number five thing I don't love about the bike, I feel that the springs are too soft, front and back. Um, you know, other reviews, some people say it's good, some people say it's too soft. It's a mixed bag out there if you read other reviews. Uh, but for me, the way I like to ride, I feel like the spring rates could be about 20 to 30% stiffer. And I'm probably an average weight around 195 pounds, around, uh, what is that, about 85 kilograms. So 
I, I don't feel that I'm particularly heavy or particularly light. I feel like it should be a little bit stiffer, both for the highway and off-road. I feel like it dives too much, and off-road, if you hit a big thing, it'll bottom out. So I wish that the spring rates were a little stiffer. And because you have the electronic suspension, uh, which makes it very complicated, it's a little bit trickier uh, to change the springs or to work on the suspension than if you had a manual adjust suspension. Okay, so number six, uh, the motorcycle is not fast. I don't want to say it's slow because, well, slow would be a relative term. It's not slow compared to a car, but it's slow compared to a GS, compared to a KTM, even the 890 KTM, this, this thing, the, the 890 will leave this in the dust. Um, it's slow compared to most of its competitors. It's around 100 horsepower, so the power is adequate, and I find that you're actually going faster than you might perceive because the bike is pretty smooth and it tends to do that. Um, but it doesn't give you a rush of, of acceleration like a lot of its competitors do. Now, keeping in mind, you know, they did, this is a trade-off because it's a low compression engine. It runs at 87 octane fuel. It's very reliable, hardly ever breaks down. Uh, it's also more affordable than those bikes. So I get it. Those trade-offs are there on the plus side. But if you're, if you're an acceleration junkie, this bike may not be for you. Now, number seven is going to be a bit controversial. Chain drive. So... This is a touchy subject because I get the benefits of chain drive. It's lighter weight, there's better power transfer, you can change the gearing uh, if you want to do that. But the downsides for a long distance touring bike, if you're going to use it that way, which I think a lot of people will, especially with this adventure sports model, the downsides are more maintenance, you have to adjust the slack, you have to lube and clean it, and you know, you're going to have to replace the chain every 20,000 miles, 30,000 miles, somewhere in there. So. Shaft drive would be kind of nice. However, the downside would be that would add weight and add some complication and you'd lose more power to the rear wheel. So I don't know the perfect answer, but I do honestly miss the shaft drive of the GS. The Africa Twin 1100 in this adventure sports is a very good bike for covering miles. So on my bike, I have these highway pegs here mounted on the crash bars, extremely comfortable. I can stretch my legs out and change my position. The windshield has a wide range of adjustment. It is frustrating that you have to use two hands. So I have to set cruise control, which annoyingly is on the right hand bar. You have to kind of take your hand off the throttle to use it. Set cruise control and then I can reach up here and do the windshield. Although Honda would tell you that you're supposed to stop to do it. The wind protection is pretty good. Once I put these little side wind deflectors on from QEs and the Puig uh, large size spoiler, once I do those two things, I can sit here 62 miles an hour or 100, and 100 kilometers per hour, very smooth, very quiet. Um, not quite as good as the 1250 GS Adventure, but I would say 80 or 90% is good. If I want to go a bit faster, 65, so at 70 miles per hour, or about 110 kilometers per hour, I feel some buffeting on my arms, but my helmet's still in good clean air. The thing I like about the bike is that it's only revving at 4,000 revs at 70 miles per hour. So it's very relaxed. It's a very relaxed bike to cruise on and cover these miles and extremely comfortable. So in that regard, I, I really appreciate the Africa Twin. The 21 inch front wheel contributes to a feeling that's not quite as secure and stable as maybe the 19 inch front wheel on a GS or some of the other bikes, but it's not a big difference and it's gonna depend on what kind of tires you have as well. These Trailmax Mission tires are very stable on the highway. So I can definitely take my hands off the bars, let the bike track itself on cruise control and it's, uh, it's a great place to be for covering long miles. Punch it. So yeah, in terms of outright acceleration, the bike's not that fast. The 1100 is a lot better than the old 1000, gives you a lot more torque, quite a bit more power. It's smoother as well, it sounds better. Um, but it doesn't give you that adrenaline rush that the higher horsepower bikes do. It's, it's kind of in Honda fashion, it's, it's just a little bit more laid back, a little bit more relaxed. And uh, yeah, so, so you're not going to get that quite, kind of adrenaline hit, although it's plenty fast for any practical situation. It's just not fast in an exciting way, if that makes sense. So let me show you kind of the highway passing speed. So if I drop a few gears, 
So it has good mid-range torque and everything, um, but it's nowhere near something like a 1250GS. It just, it's just not in the same universe. All right, one of my favorite uh, mountain roads, Palomar Mountain Road here in Southern California. There's a Lake Henshaw Dam. Let's uh, show you how this thing is on the twisty road. So um, I have user one mode set up, how I like to ride kind of more aggressive in the mountain roads. So I've got the hard suspension settings. Uh, I've got, well, traction control I can change independently. I've got uh, me medium engine braking and medium power mode, which is the throttle mode. It's, it still has full power. It just is a softer throttle. I don't like the super choppy throttle. So um, let's get going and kind of talk about how this bike works uh, in this situation. So a few observations that I have. Uh, we've talked about the engine. The engine is, is a linear power delivery, but it's not that fast. So it's not gonna like blow your socks off. The handling, so the handling is a mixed bag. The turn in is pretty slow. Like it doesn't, it doesn't pitch into a corner. It doesn't feel super agile or sharp. Um, so you have to you have to really kind of put some effort into getting this thing to get into a corner now when you get into a corner like this it takes a nice predictable set and it's it's um, easy to ride at a pretty elevated pace especially for an adventure bike with a big front wheel uh, a downside that there is so if you look at the when I'm hard on the brakes and this is more apparent when you're coming downhill and you need to use more braking but when you're hard on the brakes like this, the chassis has so much movement. The suspension has so much up and down um, that it's like it's like being on a kid's carnival ride. So it it's difficult to get the bike to feel balanced and kind of kind of uh, you know in good control when you're hard on the brakes coming into corners and things like that because it pitches so much forward. And that's just a that's a side effect of being an adventure bike with a lot of suspension travel and the fact that it can cope with off-road terrain you can't have everything so if you want a supple suspension off-road you're going to have a lot of suspension movement on the highway the electronic suspension does help with that somewhat but the springs are still too soft so even with the suspension in the hard mode i still have too much suspension movement and ultimately i'm held back on a road like this by the softer suspension it's not terrible but it's not as good on a road like this as like a gs is just because of the suspension uh, design And then in terms of the overall braking power, the braking power is really good and really progressive, so I'm happy with the brakes. So I specifically remember when I used to take my old Africa Twin 1000 on this same road. And this bike is is a world better. I mean, the engine's better, the chassis's better, the brakes are better, suspension's better, handles better. Still not perfect, but this is so much better than the old 1000 Africa Twin for riding like this. That guy's having a good day. Jeez, I'm just not willing to go that fast. Oh, he's gone, dude. Quick shifter's great. Quick shifter was worth every penny of the $500 I paid for it. All right, so wrapping up this long-term update number one, let's call it, <laughs> for this motorcycle. Uh, am I happy with my purchase? Yes, it is a wonderful motorcycle. One thing I, I didn't really cover on is I love the way it looks, and that's a huge thing. I, I feel 
an emotional reaction to the way that the motorcycle looks with the with the white and the blue and the red and the gold wheels, the, the, the fairing design, the headlight design, it's striking and it, that doesn't get old. And I turn around to stare at this bike every time I get off of it, that counts for a lot. And I didn't mention that before. Uh, am I happy with the purchase? Yes. Is it as good a bike as the GS that I sold? I mean, there's pros and cons to that. Is it as good as a motorcycle? Maybe not, but it's also way less money. $17,000 for this versus about $26,000 for my GS 1250 Adventure. So you can do the math on that. That's a huge difference in price. So you shouldn't expect this to be quite as good in quotes. I put that in quotes because there's some benefits to this. This bike is better off-road than the GS 1250. Uh, it has some features that I like better. The suspension, I think, is better. There's more adjustment. I like, well, I've talked about all that. The Android Auto, the technology. There's a lot of things that I prefer on this. It's a lot less weight. Uh, so it's trade-offs like this. I don't feel that, that I'm going to come out and say that this bike is way better than everything else or that this bike sucks. I, I don't have any dramatic conclusion, unfortunately, because what I found in owning and riding a lot of different bikes is they all have their unique pros and cons. But that being said, there's a reason that I plunk down my own hard-earned money to own this bike. It does everything I want to do, and it does it in a very pleasing way uh, with all the, the good things that I've talked about in this video. Now, I am going to have a separate video talking about all the modifications and accessories to this bike because there's a lot here. You've got Moscow Moto luggage. You've got Outback MotorTech crash bars. I've got, I've got a lot going on here, uh, and, and I'll have a video covering that coming out very soon, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Now, if you have questions, concerns, input, uh, discussion about this bike or how it compares to the other adventure bikes, please do let me know in the comments below, and I will make sure to get to those and follow up. So stay tuned for more content with this Africa Twin Adventure Sports. Thank you so much for watching. Please support Big Rock Moto, and there's ways to do that in the description below. Besides that, please ride safe and we'll see you out there.